Sergeants, please begin your recordings. Computer recording is up. Cloud is going. Backup is rolling. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, joint with the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at the following email address, testimony at council dot nyc dot gov. Once again, that address is testimony at council dot nyc dot gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Thank you all for joining this joint hearing with the Committee on Resiliency and waterfronts titled Oversight, Neighborhood Resiliency. The risks posed by climate change are clear. A failure to significantly mitigate carbon emissions will lead to increasing sea level rise, increased frequency of extreme weather events and rising temperatures. Unless coastal cities can adapt, these changes will cause ongoing damage to critical infrastructure, property, and economic productivity. According to a report by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, by 2100, high tide flooding will occur every other day within the Northeast and Southeast Atlantic. At this very moment, median sea level rise along the US coastline has increased by an average of nine inches since the early 20th century. New York City is especially susceptible to the risks posed by climate change. The city is surrounded by 520 miles of waterfront and has more residents living in high risk flood zones than any other city in the United States. As demonstrated by Superstorm Sandy, extreme weather events can cause catastrophic damage. That storm alone caused an estimated 19 billion in losses and multiple New Yorkers lost their lives. Extreme weather events, urban flooding impact all of our city residents. However, those with low income are particularly vulnerable. Those struggling to make ends meet have fewer resources to respond to the major disruptions caused by natural disasters. To make matters even worse, the cost of flood insurance is rising, making it less accessible for many at-risk city residents. Today, the committees will be hearing two bills designated to make the city more resilient to, to the threats posed by climate change. First, we'll be hearing intro number 586, sponsored by council member Mark Traeger. This bill will require the creation of a flood insurance relief program. At minimum, the program will provide free elevation certificates to low and moderate income households, which will help them purchase flood insurance. Second, we'll be hearing proposed intro number 962A, sponsored by Council Member Constantinides. This bill would amend the building code to limit the amount, the allowed amount of imper impermeable area at zoning lots. I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Committees on Housing and Buildings and resiliency and waterfronts that are present today. Uh, committee Council, if you could just call off the roll of uh, those present. Yes, Chair. The following council members are present in addition to Chair Cornegie and Chair Brannan, Council Members Rose, Council Member Perkins, Council Member Diaz Sr. Council Member Joni, Council Member Chin, Council Member Lewis, Council Member Cabrera, and Council Member Traeger. Thank you. 
Thank you. We are ready to hear testimony, I believe, from um, the administration. Uh, if you would administer the oath, please, committee council. Chair Carnegie, first we will hear Chair Brannon's opening, oh, and sorry. then the sponsors of the bill would like to give a brief opening as well, if that is okay. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, Justin. All good. Um, thank you so much, Chair Carnegie. Um, good morning. My name is Justin Brannon. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts, and I join uh, Chair Carnegie in welcoming you to today's joint hearing with the Committee on Housing and Buildings on Neighborhood Resiliency. I'd like to extend my thanks to my co-chair for holding this important, timely hearing today. As I, I've said before many times, New York City faces significant threats from extreme weather events and high tides. With 520 miles of coastline, the city is particularly vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise, storm surge, and high tide, or, or what they call sunny day flooding. We will continue to experience greater and more frequent damage because of climate related weather events and sea level rise. The 2020 Atlantic hurricane season, one of the most active hurricane seasons ever recorded, proved just that. With 30 named storms and the Greek alphabet being used for the second time in history to name the storms, we can see that the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season is just the start of many to come that will be record breaking. Since uh, 2005, the federal government has spent half a trillion dollars in response to severe weather disasters. Instead of being proactive, we are just playing catch up and reacting to storms instead of ensuring our neighborhoods are resilient. The Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA recently released a new online data portal called the National Risk Index. This index highlights communities across the country that are most at risk from 18 natural hazards, including coastal flooding, drought, heat waves, and hurricanes. Three of the city's five counties are listed in the second, third, and fourth places, the Bronx, Manhattan, and the borough of Brooklyn. These three boroughs are, list are listed as the communities most at risk in the nation for these nat national hazards. The city's floodplain covers 48 square miles, and this area is expected to grow to nearly 72 square miles by 2050. New York State ranks third in the nation for most homes at risk of coastal inundation from by the end of the century. More than 70,000 structures are located within the city's floodplain and are already at risk of being destroyed by severe weather. In fact, a recent study found that by 2050, 2% of the city's affordable housing units that are in coastal communities will be lost because of frequent flooding events. That's almost 5,000 affordable housing units lost because of climate change by the end of the century. The city has more residents living in high risk flood zones than any other city in the country. The most vulnerable residents, those who live in flood prone areas with little green space to absorb flood waters are often low income communities of color. Communities of color and low income individuals are, mo are also more likely to live in areas at high risk of flooding from natural disasters. Add to that, the, coast, the, the cost of flood insurance is set to increase an average of 9.9% in October of this year, 2021. These rate increases will have significant negative impacts on low income individuals or, or who already struggle to afford flood insurance even before uh, this pandemic. Policy, policy makers are beginning to consider whether communities repeatedly damaged after severe weather and flooding events should be rebuilt over and over again while expecting the same results. In the 2018 Fourth National Climate Assessment, 13 federal science agencies stated that the need for retreat or relocation from parts of the coast will be an unavoidable in all but the very lowest sea level rise projections. Today we'll hear intro 566 by council member Traeger. This bill uh, would require the city to create flood a flood insurance relief program that would provide free elevation cer uh, certificates to help uh, low and moderate income households purchase flood insurance. 
We look forward to hearing from and working with the administration on this bill. We'll also hear proposed intro 962A by council member Constantinides. This bill would limit how much impermeable area is allowed on zoning lots. Such surfaces like vegetation and permeable pavement help absorb and filter stormwater, as well as help prevent or significantly limit flooding events caused by storms. With the number of severe rainstorms projected to increase, whether a neighborhood has lots of permeable spaces or is primarily concrete and hard surfaces, will end up determining whether and how much that neighborhood floods after a, a basic rain event. I look forward to hearing from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, Department of Buildings, the DEP during today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanna thank my committee staff, uh, Committee Council Jessica Steinberg-Albin, Senior Policy Analyst Patrick Mulvihill, uh, Senior Finance Analyst Jonathan Seltzer, uh, my Chief of Staff Chris McCright, my Deputy Chief Kayla Santusuoso, as well as the staff of the Housing and Buildings Committee for all their hard work in putting this important hearing together. I'll now turn it back over to uh, Chair Cornegie. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Brennan. Um, your, your testimony, I mean, or your opening actually underscores the fact that we are a maritime city. And while we're beginning to actualize us being a maritime city and attempting to activate our waterways for both transportation and for the ability to create uh, jobs, we do have to look at the long-term impact and effects. So I think today's hearing uh, does a little bit of that. So thank you, uh, Chair Brennan, for always bringing to the council and this committee's attention uh, the need to activate our waterways, but to make sure that they're safe uh, for the long-term and our long-term use. Uh, thank you again. We have been joined by council member Barron and if council member Traeger would like to give a brief opening. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, to both chairs Brennan and Cornegie for allowing my bill to be heard today. This is very time sensitive uh, legislation related to our city's climate protection and resiliency efforts. Um, after Superstorm Sandy, uh, my district in Southern Brooklyn, as in many parts of the city, were very hard hit uh, by the storm and are still in, in recovery mode. Uh, Superstorm Sandy, as many of you know, caused over $19 billion in property damage to New York City. And yet our communities are still lacking a regional protection plan and proper funding to prepare for another uh, natural disaster. Southern Brooklyn, which includes the Coney Island Peninsula, is home to some of the most vulnerable, both economic and also uh, physical infrastructure, vulnerable coastal neighborhoods, including many uh, NYCHA housing stock that are still rebuilding years later. Um, there's an issue of equity when it comes to resiliency efforts in this city. The Regional Plan Association issued a report in 2016 stating that Coney Island is facing as much as six feet of sea level rise in the next century. The RPA concluded that resiliency planning efforts should prioritize a large number of low and moderate income renters and homeowners in New York City coastal communities. The city funding allocated for resiliency uh, projects highlights major geographic disparities. Uh, parts of Manhattan have received over $1 billion in city capital. By contrast, Southern Brooklyn has received only $32 million to elevate a few blocks of shoreline along the Coney Island Peninsula. If we're going to prepare for the impacts of climate change, future natural disasters, sea level rise, storm flooding, it is critical that the city administration provide equitable funding and comprehensive resiliency plans for all communities in New York City. One simple and helpful resource for many in my district and really in other parts of the outer boroughs would be to have a free elevation certificate program to help struggling homeowners who live in vulnerable coastal communities in flood zones. Intro 566 would create a free elevation certificate program for low to moderate income homeowners and building owners who live in a flood zone hazard. Uh, it is reported that close to 80% of those folks paying flood insurance now are overpaying. And if you were to request a flood elevation certificate on your own, you could pay upwards of $700 to $1,000 for this document. Helping establish this program would actually help offset some major costs for really struggling uh, folks, homeowners, 
uh, in, in New York City. So I really thank uh, both the chairs for their time today, for their leadership, and really, I think, driving home the conversation about equity and fairness in this conversation, which I think sometimes gets lost in, in the bigger conversation around climate change, because there are folks with the means to move, but there are many folks without the means. And I worry about not just a hurricane, but a financial storm that will lead to massive displacement of working families in our neighborhoods, which we must fight against as well. And again, I thank the chairs uh, for their time today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Traeger. I would also like to recognize council members Rivera and Rosenthal. And council member Constantinides, who just joined us, and if he would like to give a brief opening as well. Uh, good morning. Uh, I, should, I, should I start or does council member Brennan need to recognize you? I'm sorry. Uh, we, we, rec we recognize you, Chair Constantinides. You're always recognized. <laughs> Want to make sure I'm not, I'm not uh, breaking protocol, uh, but uh, thank you, Chair Brannon, for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, as everyone knows, our uh, sewer system, our, our wastewater system is designed for, as a combined system, uh, which means that when it rains, uh, the way our system deals with overflow is skewing it into our water bodies. And that sewage, that raw sewage, uh, ends up in our communities, in our water bodies, uh, around the city. Uh, intro 962 uh, attempts to help deal with that issue around uh, making, making sure that we put a cap on impermeable surface on particular sites. Uh, you know, permeable, having permeable surface allows for water capture on site uh, and preventing water from ending up in our sewer systems, ending up in our water bodies and dealing with issues around CSOs. So this, you know, this bill will help us go a small way in helping us deal with the larger issue of uh, raw sewage being dumped into our water bodies year round when it rains. Uh, so again, I wanna thank Chair Brannon. I wanna thank uh, all the members of the committee, uh, my own counsel, Nicholas Wazowski, uh, and I'll pass it back to Chair Brannon uh, to continue. Thank you for allowing me to give this opening statement. Thank you, Council. Jessica, you want to take it? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairs Carnegie and Chair Brannon. I am Jessica Steinberg Albin, Council to the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee, <clears throat> excuse me, of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point <coughs> you will be unmuted by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I announce the panelists. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. The first panelist to give testimony will be Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, followed by Joseph Ackroyd, Department of Buildings Assistant Commissioner of Technical Affairs and Code Development. Mikkel Adgate, New York City Department of Environmental Protection, Senior Advisor for Public Affairs and Communications will be available for the question and answer period. We will now administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Director Bavishi, Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd, Senior Advisor Adgate, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions. Director Bavishi. Yes. Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd. Yes. Senior Advisor Adgate. Yes. 
Thank you. Director Bavishi, you may begin when ready. Good morning. I am Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I would like to thank Chairs Brannon and Carnegie for the opportunity to testify today. I would also like to acknowledge my colleague, Joe Ackroyd, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Co-Development at the Department of Buildings, who will be providing testimony and joining both me and Mikhail Adgate, Senior Advisor for Strategic Planning at the Department of Environmental Protection in answering your questions today. As you know, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency is responsible for ensuring that New York City is prepared to withstand and emerge stronger from the impacts of climate change. With 520 miles of shoreline, adapting to more frequent and severe coastal storms is a critical part of our work. However, we're also preparing for a variety of other threats, including chronic tidal flooding caused by sea level rise, precipitation-based flooding, which can have severe impacts on inland neighborhoods, and extreme heat, which is the deadliest form of extreme weather in New York City. We call this a multi-hazard approach, since it addresses all the climate threats that impact our city. We are also taking a multi-layered approach. This means that we're focused on establishing multiple lines of defense at different scales all across the city. Some of our efforts occur at the neighborhood scale. These include enormous infrastructure projects like the Rockaways Atlantic Shorefront or the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. These efforts are extraordinarily complex, extremely costly, difficult to site, and require careful design and robust community input over the course of the design, planning, and implementation phases. However, they also bring about significant and wide-ranging benefits for thousands of New Yorkers. Another example of a neighborhood scale effort is the Department of City Planning Special Coastal Risk Districts, which were created with extensive community input and developed to limit density in our lowest lying waterfront area. These zoning rules apply to entire neighborhoods and place restrictions on what property owners can build there. We're also establishing protections at the building level. The Build It Back program, which elevated hundreds of sandy impacted homes, is an excellent example of a building level strategy. The NYC Cool Roofs program is another, another example. By painting individual rooftops with a white reflective coating, we can help reduce temperatures inside a given building. This also has the benefit of reducing energy costs for residents. Yet another example is Appendix G of the Building Code, which sets stringent standards for construction of all new structures in the floodplain. A third important pillar of our work centers around critical infrastructure. We have partnered extensively with local utilities to harden the electrical grid. Con Edison has invested more than $1 billion in climate adaptation and just last month released a new report detailing how it will incorporate climate change into its planning, design, operations, and emergency response. The city has also developed the Climate Resiliency Design Guidelines, which provide guidance on how to incorporate forward-looking climate change data in the design and construction of city capital projects. First issued in 2017, the guidelines were developed through a collaborative process with over 20 city agencies and authorities. The guidelines are already being used by some city agencies today. For example, DEP incorporates the guidance related to sea level rise into their standard operating procedures across all capital projects. As we discussed at the council hearing on January 25th, the city is now prepared to pilot the guidelines more broadly across the city's capital portfolio. The fourth and final pillar of our multi-layered approach consists of supporting communities and residents. Examples of this work include the Department of Small Business Services Business Prep Program, which provided grants and technical assistance to Sandy impacted small businesses to not only recover from, but also prepare for the next disaster. Another example is our flood insurance outreach in coastal communities through Flood Help NY, which is designed to help families understand the financial benefits of maintaining flood insurance policies for their homes. Yet another example is the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Be a Buddy program, which promotes social cohesion by creating networks of volunteers to check in on vulnerable residents during heat waves. To reiterate, our multi-layered approach includes developing neighborhood coastal resiliency strategies, building and asset level protections, infrastructure planning and hardening, and direct engagement with communities, businesses, and residents. All of this work is grounded in the best available science, guided in large part by the New York City Panel on Climate Change. Together, this represents the core of MOR's approach to climate adaptation. Our office had the opportunity to share our progress in several recent testimonies offered to council over the past few months, and we would be happy to provide more information about any specific initiatives upon your request. There is no doubt that much more work remains to be done to adapt New York City to a hotter and wetter future. A lack of funding for new projects and programs is the biggest barrier we face. Even with more funding, implementing new complex solutions won't be easy. 
and will require incredible thoughtfulness and participation of many communities and stakeholders over the coming years and decades. Despite the significant scope of the work ahead, I remain optimistic about our ability to meet these challenges. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts and the Committee on Housing and Buildings for allowing me to testify here today. I will now yield to my colleague, Joe Ackroyd, and I look forward to answering your questions after my colleague's testimony. Good morning, Chair Carnegie, Chair Brennan, and the members of the Committees on Housing and Buildings and Resiliency and Waterfronts. I'm Joseph Ackroyd, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development at the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here to discuss how the New York City construction codes address building resiliency and the legislation before the committees. The construction codes, including the New York City Building Code, are revised periodically to keep them up to date with the latest versions of the international codes and to ensure they reflect innovation in the construction industry and the latest safety standards. Since the early 1980s, when the Federal Emergency Management Agency first released its flood insurance rate maps for New York City, the building code has been periodically updated to ensure that building construction in high risk flood areas complies with and exceeds the minimum standards of the National Flood Insurance Program administered by FEMA. This process has improved the resili resiliency of building construction in high risk flood areas over time and is a process the department is committed to continuing. For example, the building code requires building constructed in high risk flood areas to be elevated to a higher standard than, the, than that required under the NFIP to ensure buildings are further protected from flood impacts. The building code also requires buildings to be floodproofed and limits use of space below the flood elevation to ensure the safety of occupants, which must be documented on a building's certificate of occupancy or through a restrictive declaration. Regulations in the building code also work to protect building systems by requiring certain components to be located above the flood elevation where the NFIP would otherwise allow such components to be located below the flood elevation. The department is in the process of revising the construction codes and expects to discuss additional amendments to the flood resilient construction requirements in the building code with the city council in the next few weeks. Turning now to the legislation before the committees. Intro 566 would create an elevation certificate program for low to moderate income owners of buildings located in high risk flood areas. Elevation certificates include important information about a building and its characteristics, including its elevation, and are an important tool for assessing a building's flood risk. The department requires that elevation certificates be submitted in connection with new building construction in high risk flood areas and recognizes the value that they could have in determining flood insurance premiums for a building. It is important that building owners understand how to use elevation certificates, which makes coupling them with financial counseling critical. Services provided to building owners through Flood Help NY which is managed by the Center for New York City's Neighborhoods and supported by the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, offers up a useful example of how this could work through its important, though it's important to note that the program's funding is set to expire in late 2022. Flood Help NY offers free services for low and moderate income New Yorkers living in high risk flood areas. These services include a home resiliency audit, which includes a free elevation certificate, backwater valve installation, and a follow-up financial counseling services related to flood insurance. Financial counseling helps building owners understand how the elevation certificate will impact their flood insurance premiums and what to do if there's an issue that arises with their insurance. The department shares the city council's goal of helping owners understand their building's flood risk and looks forward to discussing this proposal further with the city council to determine how to best accomplish this goal in light of the current fiscal climate. Intro 962 would require that impervious surfaces be limited during new construction and certain alteration projects. Effectively managing stormwater helps prevent adverse impacts and includes 
overwhelming the sewer system and flooding. There are existing regulations in place to address this issue. Through the department's enforcement of the construction codes, the department ensures that stormwater management regulations promulgated by the Department of Environmental Protection are complied with where a new building is being constructed, constructed a building is being horizontally enlarged or an alteration is increasing impervious surface areas. The department looks forward to discussing this legislation further with the committees and our partner, partner agencies to better understand how this proposal interacts with existing regulations intended to address stormwater management, including updating upcoming updates to such regulations. Thank you for the opportunity to, to testify before you today. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Carnegie and Chair Brannan. As a reminder, if council members other than Chair Carnegie and Chair Brannan would like to ask a question of the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Thank you. Chair Carnegie, please begin. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I just have a few questions because I know that um, uh, my colleagues have uh, prepared such very, um, very uh, uh, intriguing questions. So my, mine would just start with general questions. Uh, what has the city done to strengthen neighborhood resiliency? And any, any one of you can answer that, please. Uh, Chair Carnegie, thank you for the question. I'm happy to take that. Um, you know, as I explained in my testimony, we have been implementing a multi-layered strategy strategy to uh, address the multiple impacts of climate change that we face here in the city. Um, uh, so that includes uh, in intense coastal storms um, and more frequent coastal storms, um, sunny day flooding or tidal flooding due to sea level rise, uh, extreme heat and intense precipitation. Um, and we have, you know, we're implementing an over $20 billion portfolio across the city that addresses all of these impacts. So I'm not going to be able to go into every part of it in detail with you here, but, but at, at a very high level, we are implementing uh, neighborhood resiliency strategies, neighborhood wide resiliency strategies that include um, coastal protections, um, as well as land use approaches to um, make, making sure our neighborhoods are resilient and prepared for the impacts of sea level rise and coastal storms. We are taking building level approaches um, to make sure that we're um, both uh, retrofitting our buildings, but also ensuring that uh, the consideration of future climate risks is a component of any new construction or substantial rehabs. We're also um, hardening our infrastructure, working with our utility providers, as well as a, a range of other partners to ensure that we're um, accounting for, for uh, the impacts of climate change um, and, and ensuring that um, we will experience either uh, no disruption or, disruption or minimal disruptions during extreme events um, to critical services. Um, and then finally, we're taking a, a neighborhood or um, a, sorry, a resident uh, and small business focused approach so that we're um, you know, reaching out to, to residents and, and equipping them with the information and the capacity they need to make informed decisions in the face of climate change. So it's really this multi-layered strategy that, and, and, and I've only been able to, in the time that I've had in my testimony and in this response, been able to highlight some of the examples of the kinds of initiatives that we're implementing under each of these uh, layers. Um, but it's really a suite of, of efforts that were um, uh, projects, programs, initiatives, policies that we're implementing across um, all of these different uh, components of our multi-layered strategy. Um, and it's an effort that requires almost every city agency in the city government um, because it really we're, we're, we really need to establish a culture of resiliency in order to ensure our neighborhoods are prepared for the impacts of climate change. So, so, so thank you for that. I know that uh, my colleagues in South Brooklyn who have worked diligently in particular, you know, not single anyone out, but Mark Traeger and the waterfronts there um, is probably gonna have a lot more in-depth questions about it. But my, my question, my second question is, you know, we're in uh, a terrible economic downturn and there's a lot of talk about recovery and resiliency. Is the recovery and resiliency around um, the pandemic and around uh, getting out of uh, this economic downturn we're in, and usually that's centered around 
economically is usually centered around the building of in infrastructure. Are you working in conjunction with the recovery and resiliency plan that's put in place economically, or are there two different resiliency uh, plans that are in place? We're absolutely working with our colleagues um, in city government and to ensure that we're accounting for um, uh, future climate impacts um, in, in our recovery investments and recovery planning. You know, and, and I think um, we're also hoping and, and advocating for um, any future federal stimulus uh, bills to also account for the future impacts of climate change. Um, I firmly believe that any investment that we make in recovery or in stimulus um, uh, or in recovery um, for, from the pandemic or an economic stimulus must also um, account for, for future crises that we face. Um, and so we're, we're certainly um, uh, doing that advocacy and um, you know, certainly welcome you to join us in that advocacy at the federal level. Yep, so that's usually the part where I say anything my office or this committee can do to make sure that the two are running concurrently, um, uh, I'm, willing, I'm willing to step in and do. And I, I'll leave my questions there and come back on the second round and allow my South Brooklyn colleagues who I know have been at this um, for quite some time. Since I can remember, I've watched them work incredibly hard on our waterfronts, especially in South Brooklyn and downtown Brooklyn um, to ensure that there is a resiliency plan in place. And I definitely wanna hear from them. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Cornegie. I just wanna ask one sort of general question and then I wanna turn it over to to, to um, Councilman Traeger. Um, we, we all know that, that people um, living in, um, we, we all know that low income, primarily communities of color who line uh, communities across the 520 miles of shoreline um, are at higher risk of flooding from natural disasters. And overall, broadly, I guess, what what does the city plan to do to address this, this disparity that's hidden in plain sight? Uh, thanks for the question, Chair Brannon. We're absolutely um, prioritizing equity in our work. Um, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency has, an, has a strong commitment to equity, and um, we see that play out in, in, in several ways. One is that you know we're um, really relying on um, data and tools and creating more data and tools to help us make decisions that, are, um, that, that account for both physical indicators of risk as well as the social indicators of risk. Um, these are the kinds of tools that will help us to prioritize investments so that um, those communities that are uh, most vulnerable, not just from the physical impacts of climate change, but also from the socioeconomic um, vulnerabilities they face, um, will, will receive the investments um, of, of our adaptation um, and resiliency work. And so, um, you know, a good example of a tool like this is actually our heat vulnerability index um, that takes both the physical and social indicators of heat into account. Um, and uh, we are, we're trying to develop similar tools right now for coastal um, vulnerability. Um, it is um, challenging for a lot of different reasons, but, but it's something that we're working on and we're hoping that we really um, uh, create some tools that are uh, pioneering in this space. Um, we also, you know, talked about a, a bit about the um, Flood Help and Why program in my testimony, and, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it more. But it's another good example of how we are going beyond um, uh, infrastructure solutions to in, make sure that we're equipping and building capacity um, in communities to make more informed decisions in the face of climate change. So Flood Help and Why is a program that um, provides a suite of services to help residents, um, and in particular low-income residents um, take, uh, uh, make, make more informed decisions um, and, and navigate the flood insurance program. Um, we also provide services like home resiliency audits, backwater valves, and elevation certificates through the program, free elevation certificates through the program. Um, this is the kind of program that I think is really important um, for low-income communities in particular that are um, really dealing with, with the um, uh, uncertain futures that uh, climate change presents. And um, it's a program, at least now, that is um, funded by Sandy Grant dollars, um, only available in certain communities that were, that were really heavily impacted by Sandy. But we'd love to see it um, expand and um, see more permanent funding for it. So I'll stop there. Those are just a couple of examples. But um, you know, I, I just want to reiterate that 
um, we are absolutely committed to um, uh, taking an equitable approach to how we are adapting the city to climate change um, and uh, already have embedded that um, lens into our work and we'll continue to find ways to, to do that even better. Um, I, I just want to add, you know, if I could piggyback uh, uh, Chair Brandon, um, the devil's generally in the details and for communities of color, uh, the outreach has, has, hasn't been there and then the money goes somewhere else, right? So I want to be sure uh, that my office, um, to the degree that it can be, um, and, and other offices uh, like mine would certainly love to be responsible, not totally responsible, but would like to share some of the burden of getting this information into the hands of the people that need it most. Because I found that the city does have great programs in some instances, uh, but then it's the administration of those programs and it's the outreach um, where sometimes we fall short. So um, you mentioned programs that are targeted uh, like Justin asked to those communities that are the most negatively impacted. Um, what is your plan for getting that information into the, what is your plan for outreach in those same communities? Um, so different programs have different outreach strategies. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about any programs you're concerned about and follow up with your office. Um, uh, you know, we um, are uh, working to get information out in, in various ways for particular projects. We um, hold specific community meetings um, and uh, get information out. Um, uh, in that way, on flood insurance, you know, we hold annual um, and and sometimes even more frequent um, elected official calls um, on flood insurance outreach, so that we can engage um, your office and other offices in in, in that outreach work. Um, so again, um, if you're concerned about a particular program, happy to follow up with you. But we'd absolutely welcome your help in getting the word out. About well, I, yes, certainly my about, about our work committee um, as well. I have some of the most active uh, committee members in any committee uh, in, in the council. So uh, to the degree that we can be helpful in the dissemination of that information and the outreach, I'd love to be able to do that. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I would just I would just follow up and then I want to I want to turn it over to to the bill sponsors to dig in on their bills. But I, it, it bears repeating and I say it every time. Um, certainly, um, understand the, the importance of South Street Seaport in those areas, but it's not the only waterfront in the city. I do hope that at some point City Hall will truly come to terms with that fact um, because we're on borrowed time and our approach really needs to be not only urgent and, and, and community centered, but it needs to be holistic. And I think, you know, we all understand that we face multiple challenges here as a city uh, due to climate change that are aggravated by other challenges faced by low income communities and communities of color, affordable housing, sea level rise, urban heat, none of this stuff happens in a silo. So we, we not only have to be talking about this holistically, we have to be acting on this stuff holistically. So um, I wanna turn, I wanna- I just wanna emphasize that, that we have a master planning process underway in, in the South, South Street Seaport, FIDI area, um, but the project there is not funded. In the meantime, we have broken ground on Rockaway's Atlantic shorefront. We have broken ground on Eastside Coastal Resiliency. We are making good progress um, and we'll see more groundbreakings in um, Staten Island on the raised shoreline projects. Um, that are all over the city, including in, in um, Staten Island, um, Queens, and Brooklyn. Um, so anyway, I just, I just want to uh, underscore that there is work happening all across the city. Um, and, and actually, the work in FIDI Seaport still has a long way to go before we can get to a place of implementation. Um, committee Council, we could, unless uh, Chair Cornegie has other questions, I, I want to turn it into the, uh, the bill sponsors. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any more questions. I just have one statement. I just want to uh, make sure that I can change the narrative that communities of color are not interested in being environmentally responsible. That is, that is a total fallacy. The communities that I represent here in central Brooklyn and along the shoreline, those communities of color um, want to be responsible. They want to be environmentally responsible. They seek environmental justice. So their voices should not be left out in any way. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to recognize Councilmember Gradenchik, who has joined this hearing. 
Um, I will now call on council members, including bill sponsors, to ask questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, oh, sorry. A sergeant at arms will keep a timer. First, I would like to call on council member Constantinides, who will be followed by council member Joni, and then council member Rose. Council member Constantinides. Thank you, committee council, Jessica, thank you. Um, so really quickly, I have to run through these questions fast, but what benefits would be provided uh, by minimizing the area of impermeable surface at a zoning lot? Uh, what currently is the city doing um, that intro 962 uh, covers? And if we were to pass intro 962, uh, how many zoning lots would be impacted? What would be the additional benefit that the city would reap by limiting uh, impermeable surface? Uh, you know, does this, does this gonna have additional costs? And do, do you actually support 962? Um, so those are the questions I have relating to the bill. And then, you know, we talked a lot about money today. So I wanna kind of re go back to what we talked about the last hearing, even though it's not really uh, relevant to this hearing, but it's very relevant to the city that uh, Director uh, Bavishi, uh, when does MOR funding run out? Uh, how are you funded? Uh, can we guarantee will there, that there will be an MOR uh, past 2022? if we don't take action as a city uh, and ensure that your division, which is critical to all the things that you talked about, will continue into the future because we cannot afford to not have an MOR uh, in the city of New York. Uh, so I'll, I think I shot out enough questions uh, that I think the three minutes will be covered by all the answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Con Council Member Constantinides. I'll take your um, uh, last uh, questions first and then I will pass it off to my colleagues to talk about your questions on the legislation. Um, on funding for MOR, um, uh, as I mentioned at our last hearing, um, MOR is funded with uh, community development block grant disaster mm -hmm. recovery dollars. Um, that grant is set to expire in September of 2022, um, although I believe that our funding will be exhausted a few months sooner than that. Um, there is still a, a decision that needs to be made about the continuity of MOR uh, beyond the federal funding. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a, a, a decision that, that is um, uh, still pending with OMB. Um, I will pass it off to my colleague, um, Assistant Commissioner Ackroyd, to talk about the, the legislation. All right, I'll just say how deeply concerned I am. Um, I think we need to make a commitment. This is part of the problem that I have with uh, your office being a mayoralty and not being a full department. I think we need a Department of Sustainability and Resiliency that we can actually, uh, you know, if we were not asking these questions, we would not know because we're not allowed to have budget hearings on MOR or MOS. Uh, so we need full transparency. We need to make sure we have you. We need to make sure there isn't a brain drain from your offices. We need to, to keep and retain good staff that are doing the good work that you're doing. And I appreciate the work that you're doing. So we need to keep you and ensure that this division uh, is there in the long term and expanded. At a moment when we're trying to fight our city's resiliency you know, battle, we can't not have an MOR. So I mean, I, I'm just going to put that again on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, just quickly, I, I tried to jot down the questions that you had as quickly as I could. I will try to get as many as I can, and, and then I will pass it off to um, my colleague at uh, New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so with regard to your question about how many lots um, the actual legislation will uh, encompass, I, I don't have that information handy. We'll have to, to uh, mine that information and, and, and get it to you. Um, with regard to the benefits of the legislation, uh, limiting impervious surfaces um, would, would essentially decrease runoff and also help to lower uh, surface temperatures. Um, so I think those are two of the benefits that I'm aware of that would uh, be the result of limiting impervious surfaces. Um, with regard to the current regulations that may be um, on the books that, that kind of uh, uh, are similar to what this intro seeks to accomplish. 
the construction codes require that stormwater management regulations pro promulgated by the Department of Environmental Protection be complied with when a new building is constructed, uh, when a building is being horizontally enlarged or an alteration um, that increases impervious surfaces is proposed. And so I think it might be a good time for me to, to hand the, the baton over to uh, Mikkel with uh, Abgate with New York City Department of Environmental Protection just to discuss um, the DEP regulations related to stormwater management. Thank you. And thank you, council member, for these questions. You know, at the outset, I want to say that um, the agency certainly supports the council's goal to continue to reduce impervious area. Um, as you know, we have a, a very large over a billion dollar green infrastructure program to continue to, you know, soften existing um, hard surfaces in order to better manage stormwater, to increase capacity in the sewer system, and to reduce combined sewer overflows, as you mentioned in your opening. Um, in terms of new development, obviously we worked very closely with you and your team last year to pass intro 1851, which greatly expanded our rulemaking authority when it comes to stormwater management on new construction and also prior um, stormwater controls, both during the construction phase, but also um, post-construction controls like green roofs and pervy, um, excuse me, pervious pavers and other um, green stormwater management techniques. Um, and so, you know, with the passage of 1851, we are still in the process of drafting that unified stormwater rule, which will impact all new construction in both the combined sewered areas of the city and the separately sewered areas of the city. And so we look forward to working with you to ensure that, you know, 962, um, you know, to figure out how it interacts with both the existing stormwater regulations, but also the forthcoming regulations as we finalize the drafting of the rule as we um, release our stormwater design guidelines to ensure that there's no conflict and um, to ensure that, you know, new construction that's coming to us for site connection permits, for stormwater management permits, that they know at the outset what the regulations and the requirements are. Um, in terms of your question about, about cost for compliance with stormwater rules, um, we'd be happy to share uh, some of the analysis that we've done in terms of potential costs for new construction as it relates to compliance. Um, we did that at length in the lead up to 1851 being passed. So we'll, we're happy to share that with your team. Uh, wonderful. No, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I think we all share the same goal of keeping uh, as much water out of our sewer system as possible, right? So I think that 962 seeks to continue that work. So I look forward to having these conversations. And I thank both uh, Chair Carnegie and Brandon for allowing me to ask these questions this morning. Thank you, Council Member Constantinides. We will now turn to Council Member Joni, followed by Council Member Rose. Council Member Joni. Thank you so much. And I want to thank the uh, chairs for this very important uh, hearing on the future of all of our waterfront communities. Uh, Director Bavishi, you mentioned all of the boroughs, with the exception of the borough of the heard you talk about Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. And there was not even an utter of the borough of the Bronx. And we have a tremendous waterfront community, ranging from City Island to all of Frog's Neck, which includes Edgewater Park, Silver Beach, Locust Point, Country Club, a slew of marinas, uh, beach clubs. How can I assure my constituents that we'll have a fairness of equity on the $20 billion that uh, you stated we have funded. In addition, can you please elaborate more about the $20 billion? Where's that money coming from? Has it been earmarked? And what assurances can we have that all communities, all boroughs will be receiving fair 
equitable distribution of these limited funds. Uh, thank you, Council Member, for the, the question. I'm so glad you raised this issue. So 15 billion, over 15 billion actually, of the $20 billion that I referenced earlier are actually post-Sandy federal recovery dollars. Um, and you know, and this really underscores a challenge that we have with resiliency funding in general. Most of the dollars from the federal government for resiliency and adaptation flow after a disaster. And we really need to be able to take proactive action in order to get ahead of these challenges. So this is just, uh, just I wanna highlight this because this is something that we could really use um, the council's help on is continued federal advocacy for access to more proactive funding um, for climate adaptation and resilience. Um, but, but given that, you know, Sandy um, was a storm that, that happened to impact some of our other boroughs in the city more than it did the Bronx. And um, another coastal storm, of course, could go in a different direction or could come at a different time um, and, and, and the impacts would be different. So again, you know, because we are using post-Sandy federal recovery dollars in order to advance so many of our resiliency projects, um, the dollars have been invested um, in, in areas that were the most impacted by Sandy. Now, with that said, I want to highlight that we are going to be, um, we are making good progress on the Hunts Point energy resiliency project and, and that will be uh, that will continue to move forward. Um, we also um, you know, mentioned the heat vulnerability index before. Um, we, we recognize that the South Bronx is one of our most heat vulnerable communities in the city and so we have prioritized the South Bronx as a neighborhood that is um, uh, receiving investments and um, where we're piloting many of our heat resiliency efforts including um, the Abuddy um, where we're targeting NYC cool roofs, uh, roof coatings, um, and where, where we're targeting street plantings to really make those neighborhoods cooler. Um, so, uh, so, so we we are certainly working with our partners in the Bronx um, to advance really important resiliency efforts there. Um, but we do need access to uh, proactive federal dollars to um, be able to continue um, the work in the Bronx at the same scale that that is happening in other parts of the city. Thank you, Director. You highlighted something that is. Uh, the city, and for a large degree, uh, a good portion of the country relies on the food distribution from Hunts Point. You mentioned uh, being proactive, let you understand the exposure that we have as we face climate changes and more flooding in the future. You mentioned uh, being proactive and the $15 billion was allocated, yet in my own district, Edgewater Park, still has a firehouse, a volunteer firehouse and a community center that has not been rebuilt after Hurricane Sandy. We have a slew of seawalls that protect communities and streets that have not been rebuilt after Hurricane Sandy. We know that the money was not fairly distributed throughout the city. And I keep hiding the borough of the Bronx and I really need to know when will this district this borough will see its fair share. The damage was done. It still hasn't been addressed. And from what I'm understanding, there is no plan that's going to protect the borough of the Bronx and its residents. Can you help me fight for Edgewater Park and other coastal communities that have still not been rebuilt after Hurricane Sandy? As we talk about resiliency to protect future flooding and damage. What commitment can I get from MOR. Thank you, Council Member, for, for raising the issue. I'm happy um, my office will follow up with your office to look into the particular um, issues you're raising. Um, we're happy to have a follow-up conversation with you and, and um, understand what's going on there. What about assurances for a fair distribution based on equity by borough? Uh, so, so absolutely, for, for, the, for the resources that the city controls, we are um, absolutely committed to ensuring um, an equitable approach to distribu distributing the money. Um, what I will say about um, the federal resources that, is that those resources um, went to the communities that were most uh, devastated by, by Hurricane Sandy. Um, and, and this is, like I said, it, the problem here is that we need to be able to do more proactive planning and access the resources for more proactive planning. Um, what happened here is that we have, are investing resources that came after 
greater Sandy to, to building a more resilient city. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's um, uh, important that we do this, um, but, but uh, it, is, it, it is still quite reactive because of the way federal resources flow. Um, we, we really need to be able to access resources in a proactive way so we can get ahead of these challenges and not rely on which community was devastated to, um, to, to determine which community um, gets investments. And but so- Director, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. The borough of the Bronx was affected by Hurricane Sandy and it did not receive its fair share to deal with the damages. You're not answering that question. They, what, this community was impacted by Hurricane Sandy, yet it did not receive its fair share, and it still has not been rebuilt. The federal funding was allocated to the city. The city made the decision on where that money was going to go, not the federal government. They allocated it for building the time. Um, so, so uh, just to be clear, there were different kinds of federal funding that were allocated to the city. In some cases, it was the federal government that allocated the dollars to particular projects and particular communities. And in some cases, the city made those decisions. But like I said, council member, I am happy to follow up with you and, you. Um, and, and understand the issues a bit better. Thank you. Then my only, the last question I have chairs and thank you for the courtesy is, is DOB uh, properly staffed to help with neighborhood resiliency efforts and education and outreach. Thank you for the question, Councilman. Um, I believe that the that the department uh, working in conjunction with the mayor's office of resiliency is adequately staffed uh, to handle the outreach. I think that that um, you know that that we are good at getting. Um, the word out, um, but I think it's a, a multi-agency effort. And as uh, as Ms. Bavishi uh, previously talked about the the um, various means that are used to get the word out on um, a lot of the legislation, uh, this is something that the Mayor's Office of Resiliency usually spearheads when it comes to these types of efforts. But you know, as it pertains to the Department of Buildings, I think that we have the resources, um, but we will certainly reach out um, if that's not the case. Thank you for that answer. But do you know what the staffing level is? Can you tell me how many people are working full time on the resiliency effort of educating and getting the word out? I don't have that information for you currently. I apologize. Chairs, can I ask that you follow up to get that answer? I think that would be extremely important as we talk about educating and bringing awareness and helping fair, equitable distribution. If we don't even know the staffing levels of this uh, tremendous undertaking, how are we going to determine that we are up to being proactive, let alone reactive on something so complicated? Thank you. Thank you, council member. I would just like to recognize that council member Ulrich has joined this hearing. And now we'll turn to council member Rose for her questions. Thank you. Um, I, I just really would like to echo um, council member Jonai's frustration in terms of, of equity, um, in terms of, of communities that, that receive the support. Uh, it, it seemed to be, um, it, it definitely wasn't equitable. And so um, my question was sort of on the same line as council member Jonai's. Um, when you referenced one NYC and the Ray Shoreline projects, um, you referenced uh, you know, uh, several projects. There's um, the East Side, Coastal, Brooklyn Bridge, Battery Park, and there's even the South Shore of Staten Island Coastal Risk Management Project. Um, could you tell me uh, all of the, you know, the, the, the area that that particular project covers um, on Staten Island? The South Shore Staten Island Coastal Risk Management Project? Um, sure, Council Member. The, the South Shore, uh, South Shore Staten Island Coastal 
service management project is a mouthful, um, is a, a partnership between the city, state, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And it actually is a bit of a misnomer because it does um, protect the east shore of Staten Island. Um, it's about a, a five and a half mile long project um, uh, along the east shore of Staten Island. Does that extend um, all the way to St. George? Is that inclusive of no, St. George? No, and um, and the North Shore, uh, um, the North Shore is totally not a part of um, of that project, is it not? Uh, it does. It does not uh, cover the North Shore of Staten Island. No. Uh, and and so my point uh, goes back to uh, Councilmember Jonai's point. Um, the North Shore sustained um, an equal, you know, a, a substantial amount of damage. Uh, one of my businesses on my North Shore uh, sustained over a million dollars worth of damage. And um, it was really hard for them to even collect. Um, and uh, any sort of aid or help was almost, um, was, was very minimal or, um, or definitely we didn't receive the type of attention that the South Shore uh, received. So um, I'd like to know what is what are the metrics that's used to determine uh, the, the aid, the level of aid that um, the East, all of these are coastal, um, you know, communities. What what's the metrics that's used to determine, you know, um, the amount of aid that they're getting, uh, the attention, um, um, even even the flood insurance rates. What what metrics do you use? Since uh, we've seen that it, it hasn't really been equitable, so could you tell me what metrics you use? I'm sorry. I will mute myself. Um, in terms of flood insurance rates, um, council member, we, um, the city does not actually set flood insurance rates. I want to be very, very clear that FEMA at the federal level sets flood insurance rates. Um, and uh, in terms of um, other, other metrics, um, I want to just take a step back and first explain, um, as I, I say very often, resiliency is a process, it's not an outcome. So when I um, mention the, you know, over $20 billion we're investing in resiliency now, um, I just want to be very clear that we're not going to be done with the work of building a more resilient city as, um, a, a, as we spend these $20 billion. Um, we will need access to, to more resources. And I said in my testimony, um, funding and financing is one of the challenges that we continually face. And, and I would say is the biggest challenge that we face um, because because so often these much needed federal dollars flow after a disaster. Um, and so we, we really need to think creatively about how we access funding and financing um, to, uh, to do this work um, as we, as we uh, sort of move into the next phase of, of resiliency planning and implementation for the city. Um, so, so I, I just want to, I want to be very clear about that because I, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to think that we are finished with the work of resiliency with the current set of projects that the city is advancing right now. Uh, you know, I, I thank you, you know, for your response and I know it's a process, it's but, um, but how do you get, you know, you determine the cue, you know, that there are communities that are, um, like Council Member Joe and I said, are so far out of the queue, when, you know, when will we see, begin to see the resiliency efforts start to take, you know, take shape? Uh, understanding it's a process, understanding that there's funding that, you know, has to be, you know, a, a, accumulated, but, but really, it's it's how how does one you know get in the queue and 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 begin to be a part of the process? Hurricane Sandy has been you know over five years ago now. So, so you know, I, what I would say is that we are we are concerned about um, all all of our coastal communities. Um, we are um, uh, you know working to actually um, uh, uh, 
develop a, 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 a transparent way to communicate how we're assessing risk and how we are planning for um, for coastal resiliency. And I will also just say that you know not every coastal community will will um, uh, have the same kind of coastal protection. These projects are very very tailored to the particular site conditions, to the particular waterfront uses, to the to the way that um, our waterfront is is um, uh, uh, engaged with and used. And so we we really have to it, 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 you know the, the um, implementability of these projects looks really really different in different parts of our coastline. Um, it's incredibly complex, um, and uh, we are you know we are working to to um, uh, engage in that um, in that planning, um, but then also very very importantly working to advocate for the resources to actually move plans into implementation. Will we, will we know when, you know, when you're talking about even beginning to have the conversations about implementing these other strategies for, um, for those districts that are not currently included in some of the shoreline projects? So, so again, again, I just want to refer back to my testimony that we are taking a multi-layered approach to resiliency. So we are, um, you know, we're 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 um, engaging um, residents and businesses. We are um, working on building retrofits and 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 um, working to strengthen our building code. We are um, working to harden infrastructure. Um, so, so I just want to be clear that shoreline protections are not the only aspect of our resiliency resiliency approach. Um, and so, you know, be, just because you don't see a shoreline protection project going up does not mean that your community is not receiving any investments or any benefits from the resiliency um, uh, program that we're implementing now. Um, but with all this said, you know, Council Member Rose, I welcome your partnership and I would be happy to follow up with your office to talk more about this. Council Member Rose, did you have any additional questions? Um, I want to I want to say thank you, and I do understand that there's different resiliency, you know, efforts that are taking place. It's just um, the education, um, the the um, access to transparency is is what I'm you know I'm looking for. I, I want to know when when these um, you know when reach when you're reaching out to the businesses to the residents. Um, and, and what measures you're, you're taking other than I, I know there's a lot more than the shoreline projects going on. I, I want there to be open communication so that I can talk to my constituents, let them know what's available so that they can avail themselves of it so that, you know, um, we can start to see some of the inequities being addressed. And, or know that they're being addressed. You know, right now, um, it's not transparent enough that we even know that, you know, um, some of those inequities are actually being addressed, at least in my district. Uh, the South Shore is, is very clear. There's a plan, there's a process, and everybody's aware of it. I don't know, I don't see anything happening on the North Shore of my district and, um, and the East, all the way down to um, to St. George. So um, I, I'm really happy to hear that. We'll we'll be in touch. We'll we'll continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosen. One other opportunity I will flag for you is that. Um, you know, we have also been advocating for the start of the restart of the New York and New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study, which the Corps was advancing um, until it was abruptly stopped um, early last year. Um, and so, you know, we would also welcome your advocacy seeing your partnership um, to get that study restarted. That is, of course, a decision that the federal government has to make. And we're hopeful that with the incoming um, Biden administration, um, we will be able to get that study restarted. And it's going to be a really important study to um, really uncover uh, new coastal um, strategies and solutions for, for many areas of the city. Thank you, Council Member Rose. We will now turn to Council Member Barron for questions. Thank you. I want to thank the chairs, uh, Carnegie and Brannon, for holding this hearing. And uh, just to infuse a little bit of Black history 
and to support the comment that I heard from uh, Chair Cornegy, certainly Black people are very much interested in the environment. It's historic. We've had well-known Blacks during the Civil and Revolutionary Wars who were engaged in using their skills. We know about the extensive Black community that existed successfully in Sag Harbor, as well as other parts of Long Island. We know about the Black communities that lived in Nova Scotia. So we don't want to discount the interest that Black community has in the environment. So just want to share that with you. Uh, I've heard some of your testimony. I didn't hear all of it. So if uh, I'm repeating things, please in, in, uh, indulge me in my questions. How can we, as my colleagues before me have indicated in terms of understanding transparency and equity, how can we know, how can we be assured that our communities, particularly those that have a shoreline, are getting their fair shore? There was an a, a environmental justice bill that was passed I think it was 2018, I was proud to be able to sponsor it along with colleague uh, Constantinides, which talks about black communities having been unduly burdened in the past with those negative environmental factors and that the city has an obligation now to talk about both sharing the benefits as well as the burdens. So what is the formula? And I think one of my colleagues addressed this issue earlier. What's the formula that you're using to make sure that the 500 and somehow odd acre miles of shoreline is getting some type of equity in the distribution of how these funds are being allocated, how they're being planned, how they're being adjusted for that part of the shoreline that's commercial, as opposed to that part of the shoreline that is residential? And there's a particular question that I have following that one. Oh, and also I wanted to include uh, parts of Staten Island for my, co for my colleague, Debbie Rose, that were uh, populated and thriving by the Black community that was there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, council member, for your questions. So one of the things that I um, uh, noted earlier in I think one of my other responses was that the city, city's developed a, a pioneering heat vulnerability index. And I'll explain why this connects back to your question in just a second. So this heat vulnerability index takes physical indicators of heat risk into account, like um, uh, lack of vegetation and density. And it also takes social indicators of heat risk into account, like race and poverty. And we overlay those and it helps us determine which areas of the city are both most socially and physically at risk for the impacts of extreme heat. And then we invest our um, heat resiliency um, uh, dollars and, and programs into those areas of the city. Um, similarly, we are really working to model a new tool um, that will show coastal vulnerability in the same way. Um, this is something that um, really hasn't, hasn't been done before for a city as complex as New York City, so it will be new, but it is something that we're working on so that we can have a better um, indication of both physical and social vulnerability to coastal risk. Um, it's something that I'm happy to talk to um, your office about um, as a follow-up to, to this hearing. And so how does, you're, you're planning then to use that same uh, technique and model to identify the coastlines? Is that what you're saying? Coastal vulnerability. Coastal vulnerability, okay. So as we're looking to put plans in place to protect particularly the coastline, part of my community is the Jamaica Bay uh, coastline. And it includes what is now Shirley Chisholm Park, in which we have to make sure that we acknowledge that it was a city that over the years, this administration's and previous administrations that I think invested, I think of a hundred million dollars to make sure that we capped that area. And adjoining this Shirley Chisholm State Park is a the Spring Creek Preserve. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's one of the bays off of that. And the residents there are concerned that there's coastal erosion going on. Uh, we did have a meeting last week. My chief of staff had a meeting with representatives from your office, as well as other departments and agencies, and they're going to come and do a site visit to determine 
what might be the causes. And they say it may be the rise in sea level and other factors and not necessarily erosion. But to that point, my colleagues are introducing legislation talking about provisions that the city needs to take, provisions that need to assist persons who in fact may be subjected to this erosion so that they don't lose their homes, lose their property, and we'd be proactive in that regard. So what are the plans in that regard for privately owned uh, coastlines? This is owned, this part of the coastline is a condominium that was developed there. There were, I don't know how many homes, not a lot, but there are condominiums. And what might be the programs that we can address to assist them moving forward? Um, I'm sorry, council member, I'm gonna have to follow up with you in your office. I okay. don't think it was my office that met with your staff last week. So let me- um, uh, well, it wasn't you, it was someone else, yes. Yeah, let, let me better understand the details and then I'm happy to have a conversation with you about it. And where can we see a comprehensive listing of all of the projects and programs and money and ideas and initiatives and support that is available. Yeah, the, the Sandy Funding Tracker, which is a, a tracker that OMB um, hosts, um, and it was uh, created in partnership with Council, um, does list all of the, the Sandy funded projects. Um, and so you can find that online. Um, and and it, uh, it, you know, it, it is, um, it, it's all the Sandy funded, uh, the, sorry, sorry, the federally funded uh, post Sandy projects. Um, so that is a really good resource. And of course, we we're happy to um, talk with you if you have feedback on how we can better communicate um, our work. Um, the challenge with, with communicating resiliency efforts is that it's an all of city endeavor. Um, every city agency is involved in resiliency in one way or another. Um, so uh, it is certainly challenging to communicate the, the, the breadth and the depth of what we're doing, but, but we certainly appreciate your feedback on that. And well, uh, I think we're, that we're always looking to improve how we do that. Thank you. I think that's something very important as my colleagues have talked about in terms of transparency. We need to know what it is that's there and how you're projecting the uses. But I wanna thank the, both chairs for indulging me and uh, thank the administration for coming and presenting. Thank you. Thank you, council member. I will now turn it back to Chair Brannon for additional questions. Thank you, Council. Um, I just I wanted to ask one last question, um, and just to really drill down on because I don't want to be surprised by this. I don't think any of us do. Um, obviously, there have been significant funding cuts at both the federal and state level and the city level um, it, because of the economic crisis we're experiencing because of COVID. Um, will we have an answer in, in a in a real way that we can prepare for? as far as if these funding cuts are gonna affect uh, any of our capital projects that are in the pipeline. And if they are, how we're gonna prioritize which ones get funded going forward. Uh, no resiliency projects are um, currently affected by um, funding cuts or by pauses. So none of the none of the current resiliency capital projects are are in de, in jeopardy. Uh, that's right. Not, not, no no um, resiliency capital projects are currently affected by funding cuts or pauses. And and why? I mean, and how do we know it's going to stay that way? Um, you know, I, uh, I I I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I think that's a, a question for OMB. Okay, but but so basically what you're saying is as of now, February 8th, 2021, none of these projects are, are in jeopardy, but but I'm assuming they're going to be on the chopping block like everything else that might get cut. Um, like I said, Chair Brennan, I, you know, I, I um, can uh, report out on what I know now, um, but I think in terms of budget process, those are those are questions um, that are that are better suited for OMB. But but there's no. Um, I guess, I guess further that there's, there's no way to, um, that these projects are gonna be sheltered in some way or protected or, or immune to cuts, right? Have you been given, have you been given any indication from OMB 
that resiliency capital projects will, will be immune to uh, budget negotiations and cuts? Uh, I know that this is, um, that resiliency is, is a top priority of the mayor and the administration, um, and OMB is certainly treating it in that way. Um, uh, I, as far as whether or not um, the projects are immune, I, I don't know that anything is immune right now because this is um, really such an incredibly tough budget environment. Okay, council, I'm good. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to testimony from members of the public. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. I would now like to welcome Laura Rothrock from the New York Coalition of Code Consultants, followed by Lyric Thompson to testify. Laura Rothrock, you may begin when the Sergeant calls time. Starting time. Good morning, Chairs Carnegie, Brandon, and members of the New York City Council. My name is Laura Rothrock and I'm providing testimony on behalf of the New York Coalition of Code Consultants, also known as NYCCC. We are a nonprofit trade organization whose members specialize in con securing construction and development approvals from municipal agencies, as well as building code and zoning consultant consulting. I'm testifying today in opposition to intro 962A, which would limit the allowed amount of impermeable area of zoning lots. As currently drafted, the, proposal, the proposed law would limit development of lots to 50% of the total area, which is contrary to the zoning law, which stipulates lot coverage and in many cases allows development to be greater than 50%, up to 100% for some sites. While we understand the importance of permeable surfaces and their positive environmental impact, this proposed legislation is extreme. New York City may be a concrete jungle, but residents also live sustainably through dense housing and take advantage of walkability, proliferating bike lanes and public transportation. There are ways to encourage more sustainable development without completely stifling new construction opportunities. Should the law be accepted as drafted, it would do irreparable harm to future development in the city, including housing and affordable housing. Our city is in a crisis and we will need to encourage new development, not completely restrain it as part of our economic recovery. We thank you for your consideration. Thank you. We would now like to welcome Lyric Thompson to testify. Lyric Thompson, you may begin when the Sergeant calls time. Starting time. It appears that Lyric Thompson is no longer available. This concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Carnegie and Chair Brannon for closing remarks. Chair Carnegie. Chair Carnegie, you seem to be muted. Please stick with us. Oh, there. I'm here. I'm here. So I want I want to thank my colleagues for participating in this hearing. Um, in this, this is there's no better time to, to have a conversation about resiliency on our waterfronts than during a period when we are pivoting and shifting to reshape the city of New York. This conversation is timely. 
The needs of our communities along the waterfronts are timely. I wanna thank the participation of the administration here. Um, we will be following up as a committee and also as my office to do a couple of things. One is to help disseminate the information to those at-risk communities that, that are along the, 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 the shorefronts. Also to work diligently to make sure that the programs actually match the needs and are not so lofty that the people on the ground are not getting the resources necessary to recover uh, in this process. We know that there, as the city pivots and shifts characteristically, there has figuratively and literally been a washout of very vulnerable people. And we wanna ensure that that figuratively and literally a washout along our waterfronts doesn't happen to communities that have resided there um, and that need to benefit from the programs being introduced uh, here today. Um, I want to thank my, my, my colleague and co-chair, Justin Brennan, for helping me um, facilitate this hearing. I want to thank the advocacy of both Mark Traeger and Costa Constantinides, not leaving out, of course, uh, Debbie Rose in Staten Island. Um, uh, so I want to thank those, water, those who represent our waterfronts, uh, Steve Levin and Lori Cumbo. Um, so many of us are representatives of the waterfronts and are responsible for being good students, uh, good stewards of not only their care today, but for their future resiliency. So thank you for this. Chair Brannon, you're closing. Thank you, Council. Um, look, we said it a million times, New York City has 520 miles of shore lined primarily by low-income communities of color and the so-called outer boroughs. Uh, these are working families, children, seniors, all on the front lines of extreme weather, whether they like it or not. And that is why racial justice is climate justice. And that's why this is so damn important. Extreme weather is both a race and a class issue as well. Um, New York City is facing converging crises now due to climate change, aggravated by other challenges faced by low-income communities and communities of color, for affordable housing, urban heat, sea level rise, just to name a few. Uh, we can't just talk holistically, we have to act holistically. Um, it's been almost, gonna be this year, nine years since Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I think City Hall bristles a bit when we suggest that they only care about lower Manhattan, but there's truth there because residents living on the rest of the New York City shoreline, uh, aren't feeling it, aren't seeing it. My colleague, uh, Councilwoman Debbie Rose on the other side of the Verrazano Bridge asked about the Staten Island's North Shore. She's basically being told, well, resiliency measures are happening there. You just can't see it, which is crazy. It's insane. There's a reason that there's the stereotype that City Hall only cares about certain areas. It's because areas in the Bronx and Staten Island are not, and Southern Brooklyn are not getting attention. Um, and there have been significant cuts at both the federal and state level um, how do we know that these cuts are going to be uh, protected? How do we know that the resiliency capital projects or the resiliency office, the mayor's office of resiliency itself is not going to be cut? Um, it's crazy that we, we even have to worry about this right now, but here we are worrying about it and we need to be proactive. So I thank everyone for, for their testimony today. I thank the, the, um, the co-sponsors and sponsors of this important legislation. And of course, uh, to my co-chair, uh, Robert Cornegy, for this important hearing, and we will be following up on all these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brannon. I will now turn it over to Chair Cornegy to close the hearing. Chair Cornegy. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your participation. This hearing is commenced.